Well, thanks for joining us again. We continue in Acts chapter 17, talking about race and racism from um, what the Bible has to say, specifically Acts chapter 17, where the Apostle Paul is talking to philosophers at Mars Hill in Athens. And he says this, which gives us just a brilliant theology for race. Paul says, from one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that might, they might seek God and perhaps reach out and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. We pointed out last time that the Apostle Paul makes it really clear that if we understand race biblically, we will understand there is no such thing as multiple races. There is one race. All people come from one man. Now, there are many nationalities. There are different ethnic groups. But we are essentially, in God's eyes, unified because, as we said last time, we are made in his image, Genesis 1, 7, 127, and it is clear that God loves us all because God sent his son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And so we're talking about how do we become um, agents of peace in a time when so many are being torn about, torn apart by race, and this is especially important because, again, as we said, um, Jesus said the two most important commandments are to love God and to love people. Race is an affront to God, dishonors God, and it dishonors people. So we, we must be agents of peace. We must not go along with the racism of our generation. We must see the world through God's eyes, through upper story eyes, see the lower story so that we can love God and love people the way that honors God and the way that genuinely loves people. And that would mean do not be conformed to this world and the way the world thinks of race, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One of the things we mentioned last time is that that means in the words of God to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, don't look at the outward appearance. Human beings look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. So how can we be agents of peace in a time where there's so much division? In a world, there, we, I said last time, there are two ways that we can deal with race. There is a way that people deal with race that leads to what we're experiencing in our world today. The way the world deals with race, has dealt with race in the last two years, has not made things better, it's made things worse. It has deepened the anger, it's deepened fear, it's deepened divisions, it's not caused people to feel at peace and to be able to be redeemed and to be able to forgive and to find wholeness. It has deepened hurts and deepened divisions. And we can go around, and, and, and what the world does is it goes around and points fingers saying that person's the fault, that person's at fault, that person's at fault. There's no place in the Bible that says the answer is go, it's other people's fault. As far, again, Romans 12, as far as it is, as far as you are able, live at peace with others. You do what you can to bring peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for there's the kingdom of heaven. So, if we are going to lead the way and be different in this world and not just go along with what you learn in college, what they're trying to peddle in the news, but we actually address race and racism biblically, what's it going to mean? First, it means we have to watch our own reactions to people who are different from us. We have to watch our own shallow nature, and we all can do it, that tends to judge based on appearances and not based on the heart. So, do you judge people because you see somebody is rich or somebody is poor, either a positive or a negative? Are you overly impressed with somebody because they have certain credentials? Do you tend to see somebody as kind of lower on the ladder 
if they don't have credentials? Or do you see everybody as equal in God's eyes because they are valued by God and loved by God, and therefore they are loved by God just as much as you and I are? Yeah, I think that I'm pretty much loved by God. I'm, some days I, I wonder how God loves me. But I mean, honestly, there's a part of me that thinks, yeah, God loves me. Yeah, God, you know, God, God takes me as a child. Can you look around you and say, just as God loves you, even though you're kind of despicable and ugly sometimes, so God loves everybody, values everybody. It doesn't mean he approves of everybody, it doesn't mean, but he values everybody. So check your own reactions to people. Watch yourself today and tomorrow. Are you judging on the externals? What would it be, look like? What, what, how would it change if you actually looked at people based on saying they're made in the image of God? There's no ordinary people, just people who are eternal people made in the image of God. At peace with God or not at peace with God, but eternal souls. Second, we need to think clearly and be willing to recognize the evils of racism. We need to recognize the evils of racism in the past, the evils of racism in the present as well. And it shows itself in many ways. If there are people that feel supreme because they are some color or some background or nationality, hey, <laughs> there is no haughtiness. Where the ground is level at the foot of the cross. In the same way, people should not be shamed because of externals. And it was pretty jarring when that mother in Loudoun County went before the school board and said the final straw was when her little girl came home from school one day and asked, Mommy, am I a bad person? because I was born white. Let's be honest, nothing, there's, there's no, the idea of right, white privilege is very socially acceptable. The idea of calling out people because they have white privilege, even has the appearance of spirituality. But can't you see how at the core it's racist? Yes, we all have privileges for a whole variety of reasons. And if, and some people have privileges because of their nationalities, because of the color of their skin, because they were European people that grew up in America that was highly influenced by Europe. Yep, no denying. And the Bible's really clear. If you have privilege, we are to follow Jesus' example who emptied himself and made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, found his appearance of man, humbled himself, became obedient to death, even on the cross, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place. So no matter what privileges we have, and if there's some kind of privilege because of the color of your skin, admit it, and the attitude of all of us needs to be, I need to humble myself. I need to empty myself and use that for the glory of God and the service of others. That's, that's certainly valid. The idea of feeling entitled to what somebody else has or to feel like you are a victim because somebody else has privileges that you don't have is satanic. The Bible here, the Apostle Paul points out that God made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and boundaries where they live. You know what that means? That means that there will be people who have more privileges in, than other people. You know, there just weren't many sailors, many people that developed a sailing ability and skill who lived in the Appalachian Mountains. You know, and there weren't a lot of people who learned the skills of mountain living who lived on the Mediterranean coast in Africa. 
you can look around the world and do the studies and you will see that, that, that we live in a world that is very unequal in terms of people's abilities and skills and realize first children have a much higher success rate and make over the uh, uh, studies show make more money than younger children that's not fair you know that, but it's like okay well there's just some natural differences in the worlds and for us to feel victimized because somebody has advantages that we don't have is divisive. And calling out somebody because they have their their because of the color of their skin is judge is by definition judging the 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 the, the external and not the heart. We third we must work for. So, so we need to look beyond the skin to the heart. Third, we must work for reconciliation. Again, Romans 12 makes it really clear that as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. Work for reconciliation. Here's the thing. Here's part of the, the satanic lie that leads to division. There's lots of talk about racial reconciliation. And there's a lot of minimizing of individual reconciliation. Do you see how evil that is? There is no such. Races don't reconcile. People do. Creating this expectation for some kind of racial reconciliation is creating an insatiable desire that cannot be satisfied is creating an expectation that can't be met and it is minimizing and even gaslighting what God's solution to racism is, which is personal reconciliation. We are peacemakers as far as it depends on you live at peace with others. It is peace that Jesus, that we get because Jesus brings it. We have it through Jesus Christ. Next, I would say we need to reject the divisiveness of equity. There is a huge difference between equality and equity. And a lot of times people have not discerned and they don't understand the difference. All people are equal in value and love. All people are equally valued by God and made in God's image and loved by God and want, God wants relationships with them. Um, equality means we have equal status before the law. That's why Lady Justice, you know, is, 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 has a blindfold on. It's the idea that you stand before justice and we're not looking at the outward, we're looking at the facts. We're looking at and treating everybody as according to the facts, according to e e equally. Equity means prejudice. Equity means having preferences in the process so that there can be a predetermined solution. And who gets predetermined that solution? Not God, not even the people. The predetermined solution is by people in power. So power has to be given to a small group of people who determine what equity is, what, a, what an equitable outcome is. And the problem with equity, and part of the reason it's so divisive is, again, it's insatiable. At what point are things going to be equitable enough? At what point do you get to equity and you say, everybody can be happy? You know, the thing about justice is, justice says there are just processes. Three strikes, you're out. Three outs, the end of the half inning. You know, six outs, the end of an inning. It's like, these are the rules. Everybody has to play by the same rules. That's equality under the law. Equity says we're going to treat different people by different ways so that we can make sure the result is the preferred result that a 
some elite or select number of people want. That's by nature divisive. The Bible is very clear. Don't show preference to the rich or to the poor in the judicial system. You treat people as they deserve. And the result of equality and justice is inequity. That's why God does not, God doesn't um, bless equity. He blesses faithfulness. Many examples of this in the Bible, classic examples of the parable of the talents. Many examples of this, but parable of the talents. The, 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 the one who has 10 talents, because he's doubled his talents in faithfulness, they take the one away from the one who was not faithful and they give it to the one who was the most faithful. Not to the one who had two talents that became four. You're saying, oh, we want to make things equal for them. No, God gives it to the one who's been the most faithful and therefore the one that he finds most trustworthy to be faithful. God does not, God does not reward equity for the sake of equity. God is a just God who, does, who, who honors faithfulness. Faithfulness is godliness. How do, you know how divisive equity is? Equity literally is satanic. Lucifer did not like the inequity of heaven. Never forget that. In heaven, there was not equity. Lucifer wanted a higher position. He didn't think it was fair that he, didn't, that he was in his position. He wanted a higher position. And so what happened? God threw out L- Lucifer and his minions to be the demons. They were thrown out of heaven. How divisive is equity? Equity divided heaven because Satan wanted equity. He he did not like the inequality. He did not like what he perceived as wrong in God's inequity in heaven. And now he's producing the same divisiveness here on earth, trying to convince people you cannot be happy if everything is not equitable. We are equal in value. We are equal in being loved by God. Justice is God's right way. Equity always leads to greater divisiveness. And when people confuse those, often they confuse those and with really good hearts, but they just create greater divisiveness. Jeremiah said, the way to peace, they do not know. <laughs> peace, peace, they cry, but, they, but there is no peace. They think they're going to lead to peace, but the way to peace, ungodly people do not know. But Jesus said, you are the peacemakers. So reject the doctrines, the false doctrines of, of, of race and racism today that it will just lead to greater division and, and, and anger. Instead, love God more every day and see the world through his eyes. Love God more every day and then see everybody made in his image, loved by him either saved or lost. And what really matters most in eternity is that we lead people to peace with God through Jesus Christ. Let's be agents of reconciliation. Heavenly Father, um, we know that we are all your offspring, that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Would you help us to think clearly Would you help us to read the paper and to hear the news and not think politically, but to think, uh, what has God said? How does God really see things? Help me to love as God loves and to cooperate with what God would do so that I can be an agent of peace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. I've included in the email today Carol Swain's talk on um, 
what the Bible has to say about race and racism. If you didn't watch it last time, you may want to this time. Next time, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19, a wonderful passage about a whole bunch of doctrinal stuff that's really fascinating. Until then.